Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final program, the final organized program of the third annual Racial Equity Week of Cook County Government Offices under the President. My name is Denise Barreto, and I am your hostess today, your guide, and I am so excited for this event, which is called Courage to Connect. And um, I am just, like I always say, just a, a small piece of a major puzzle of racial equity in the county. And, and today, in this event, you're going to hear some stories from some amazing folks throughout our county, including one of our county's own. Um, but I, before we get there, I want to introduce you to our host, but say a few words about our host. Our host is renegade Dr. Ada Chang. And I am so delighted to be in relationship with Dr. Chang. We met last year. We were both speakers at a conference called the Generosity Exchange. And, and since then, um, a, um, she's been a contributor to Racial Equity Week last year as well as this year. And, and I've watched her as she curates amazing um, storytelling events all the time to bring to life the voices and give a platform to folks who don't always get to um, have a platform. And I'm, I'm particularly excited today to introduce her because um, she recently, she's a tenured professor who recently um, retired essentially to pivot to do this full time, all the time. And so I'm so excited that we get to have her today. And she's coming fresh off of her 2021 Educator of the Year Award. And I just can't say enough about her. And Racial Equity Week, you see our, our, um, our website there. There are many events. If you didn't get to see them this week, you can go back to that link and watch some of the videos on our YouTube channel. There's episodes of Talk with Tony, as well as the President Preckwinkle um, reading stories. There's all kinds of things that you may not have um, seen as part of our schedule. So know that you can access this at any time. So whether you're watching it live or you're watching it on playback, we are so glad you're with us. And so at this time, I want to turn the program over to my dear friend, um, Renegade Ada Chang. Oh, thank you so much, Denise, for that introduction. I really appreciate this collaboration uh, that we met at a conference by accident, and it just flew into uh, this national collaborative effort. And I'm so honored to be invited back again for Cook County's Racial Equity Week. And thank you so much for the shout out for uh, Educator of the Year. One thing I do want to correct, I didn't retire. I'm still okay. young. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, so, sorry. But I, uh, I resigned from my tenure position to pursue art and performance and want to use art uh, for social critique and activism. So I'm doing it. I'm really excited about uh, what, what I'm doing, all the projects in particular. I'm so excited about the lineup today. Uh, so it's, it's resigned, not retired, and that also translates to hire her. Like you can hire her services to bring beautiful storytelling events to your institutions, right? Absolutely. I think it's much easier for me to work uh, going back and forth between institutions, but also outside space uh, where, um, you know, I have liberty to uh, present people voices I want to present, people I want to bring. Uh, so I kind of, I like that freedom, but you're right, I'm for hire. So thank you so much, Denise. <laughs> yes, I, I still need to make a living. Um, I, so I want to say a few words in, in terms of the conceptualization of this, this year's uh, Racial Equity Week. Um, and so one of the most important things that even though this is a Cook County Racial Equity Week. I am bringing tellers from all over the country, right? Not just within uh, Cook County, Chicago, it's everyone, and in some ways, everyone from all over the world. And what we want to demonstrate is this, whatever is happening uh, in Cook County is intimately linked to the global politics. And, and so that's one thing that is very important. The local is the global. 
and the global is going to manifest itself in the local context. So this is a national, international event, not just a Cook County event, right? So when we say racial equity week, right, it's very layered, not just at the local, national, but also global level. The second thing that is really important is that this is not just each teller. I have five storytellers, including myself. Uh, each person is going to demonstrate the importance of intersectionality. We all have multiple identities and they all manifest themselves in complex way. So this is what we're going to find out how we are connected to one another, how issues are intersectional and how it is important to connect with one another and therefore courage to connect. So Denise, should I introduce the first storyteller? Yes, for sure. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I love the fact that local is global. I think that that's the nugget. I mean, everything that you say, I'm always hanging on, but local is global. And I think that's such a great perspective for us to have going into these stories. Absolutely. And, and therefore, how do we make connection? Uh, so our perspective are not uh, myopic, right? I'm so excited for our first storyteller, Julie Evans, is a hair care professional by trade and a writer by passion. Gosh, I, you know, Julie should be considered a seasoned teller. She hails from the south side of Chicago and from a young age was influenced by its culture and art. And she has been telling writing and telling stories on my show and I met her a couple of years ago uh, at an event we were we collaborated together and I was very impressed with her stories her power and her passion so let's welcome Jolie Evos thank you so much Ada um I just want to jump right into it I was so overstimulated all of the fluorescent lights, the tangy pungent smells of hospital grade antiseptics, latex gloves mixing with bodily fluids. I was cold, like stripped naked besides my hospital gown, if it could even be called a gown since the whole back was missing. Oh, and that Foley catheter. Let's not forget that little bag of gold and joy. Cold and nauseous from being starved since the day before when I was informed that my blood pressure that I had been warning the doctor about for weeks had finally reached the point where I could die and my family could sue her. I knew from the moment that my doctor looked my sister in the eye and told her, sis, can you take her directly to the hospital? I'll call the LND and let them know she's on her way. If not, I'm gonna have to call 911. Her blood pressure is pretty high and we gotta stabilize her and get those babies out. Pretty high? What's pretty high? Because it was pretty high last week when I came in on Monday and you said it was fine. I glanced down at her notes. 210 over 140. I was going to have a goddamn stroke. My head started hurting. My ears started ringing. And I wasn't quite sure if it was the fact that I had started labor the day before, the anxiety, or the fact that I was so close to a stroke from blood pressure that had been high as hell and ignored by my doctor for weeks. My body had all the telltale signs of being in distress. Edema, swollen hands, feet, joints, extremities, headache, vomiting, dizzy spells, sweating, shortness of breath, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine surviving a whole twin pregnancy just to sacrifice your life while trying to bring it forth. Can somebody give me some Popeyes, please? I haven't eaten and I'm sure this will be my last meal. It was for a while. The rest was a stressful, surreal blur as we got me to the hospital and they pumped me with God knows what to keep me on this side of living. The cold, sterile air caused my bones to creep. They were already under about, a, about an extra 100 pounds worth of preeclamptic pressure. It was a wonder they didn't break from the stress of it all. Okay, mommy, lean forward, take a deep breath. The first thing you'll feel is about five pinches. I'm going to numb the area for the spinal block with some num numbing shots. Once I'm done, I'll go in with the needle for your block. Just try and focus on the light. Just focus on the light, Jolie. So focus on the light. Focus on the light, Jolie. There is light here. Just focus on it. 
but I had done my research. I knew that somewhere near there was a brown woman like me that probably would not survive this. She nor her offspring. Hell, the odds are never in our favor. She would probably complain of pain, dizziness, lightheadedness, the swelling, the uncontrollable weight gain. And they'd probably tell her something general like, huh, just lay off the salt and the soul food. They deem her bitchy or difficult or assume she could tolerate more pain and discomfort because of her skin. They wouldn't listen to the amount of research that she's done on healthy, healthy births of multiples, the statistics of black and the statistics of black mother's mortality rate. Her concerns would probably go ignored. My blood pressure had skyrocketed to stroke level and they told me to try and relax and try not to panic. But I, I had made it past full term with twins. I was now 38 weeks and two days and my sons were viable children. But me, what about their black mama? Was I gonna be okay? And that moment of deep breathing in, out. I talked to God for the umpteen time. God, please, whatever you do, I want these babies here and healthy. I made the sacrifice for them to be so. Whatever happens, if my penance for knowing better and deciding to have them anyway is my suffering, then so be it. But I need them to be okay. And like so many that came before me, I sacrificed myself and what I needed for the prayers of others. But martyrdom should never be rewarded for it is fruitless and it lacks accountability. And I, just an expected first time mom, was in the throes of what felt like my last month moments. How was I even to know what to ask God for? Okay, mommy, you're going to feel pressure. It's imperative that you don't jump or make any sudden movements. Remember, this is going in your spine. Just keep deep breathing and focus on the light. Focus on it. Ouch! Not just pressure. Lots and lots of pain. Jesus Christ. Breathe deep, girl. Exhale. You got this. You got this, Jolie. But it's not supposed to hurt after those numbing shots, mom. But it does. Just pretend like it doesn't. This needle has to go a little deeper. Statements like that, ma'am, are what got me here in the first place. Okay, mommy, we're all done. I'm going to check that the spinal took. Then we'll grab the team so you can meet those little babies. I felt it. As I stared into the surgical, overstimulating overhead ring light, the sawing, the tugging, the gnawing, the pulling, the anxiety, the knee weakening, blood curdling fear. I saw blood splatters. I heard the doctors whisper in hushed tones about the amount of blood I was losing because my blood pressure was too damn high for abdominal surgery. Just focus on the light, Joey. Just focus on the light. But how could I, though? I was scared. I was so scared and desperately pleading with God. Then I heard it. His cry. Twin A's cry. And my mama screamed, God damn, that's a big ass baby. And the doctor saying he needed to be tagged before we got into baby B. And the nurses, my advocates, whispering in worry tones. Okay, mommy, baby B's coming now. I felt a tug. I vomited and baby B came into this world silently. Why is he not crying? Is he okay? What's going on? And then I heard his whimper. He was okay. His brother was okay. Relief filled my soul and replaced every anxiety, every worry, every pain I had with Trump triumph as I thanked my creators for my baby's safe passage into this realm. And just like that, they became my light, my reason, my joy, my strength, my literal everything. I just hope that would be okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jolie. Thank you so much. Um, and, and just let me explain the format. Uh, we're going to, the first hour, we're going to share stories and the last portion of the event, all the tellers are going to come back and we're going to have a dialogue. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with one another and um, audience members are welcome uh, to, to pose questions and make comments. Uh, you know, Jody's story is so important. Black women has the highest mortality rate in terms of birthing. Uh, and we are in the pandemic, right? Uh, that raised the question about access to quality health care 
uh, access to health care, and even uh, in terms of the inequity within medical institution, oftentimes the embedded bias and prejudice among medical staff in terms of who can tolerate pain, what's pain, uh, whose story and narrative is legitimate. So thank you so much, Julie, for this story. Um, and we're going to bring you back in a little bit uh, in an hour to, to have a conversation. Take a deep breath. Oh, you know, it's, I, every time I hear Jolie's stories, I almost want to cry. Uh, you know, stories are stories, but remember, people live through it and are oftentimes survive to tell their tales. And, and we have to think about the emotions, their vulnerability uh, in going through the suffering that they go through and think about the questions about inequity in multiple forms. Our second storyteller. Oh, I have to say, I'm so excited to have Alex uh, Ensign uh, to be the second storyteller. And this is the first time that Alex is going to share a story. Alex Ensign uh, operates our tech today, right? Is the deputy director of communications for the board president, Tony Prewingo. Uh, before they began working in government six years ago, uh, Alex was a stellar bartender and published a silly cocktail book called Cocktails for Ding Dongs. And before that, Alex worked on a video production company and worked on the 2016 documentary, Maya Angeli, and, uh, and Still I Rise. That's fabulous. It's an important documentary to watch. I'm so excited to have Alex here. Alex, take it over. Hello, everyone. Um, just so you know, my cat likes to join me whenever I'm on a live stream. So this is my cat, Mashinka. She won't be telling her story, but she will probably be meowing during mine. So uh, my name is Alex, and it's short for Alexandra. Um, but I ask everyone else in the world, from my partner to my coworkers, to call me Alex, because Alex feels much more like me, although I do think Alexandra is a beautiful name. I've spent much of my life wrestling with my gender, with both how I feel about my own gender and how others view me. Walking through the world, it always feels like I can never quite put my guard down or forget that I'm different. Spending the past 20 years living in Chicago, I've also been keenly aware of how privileged I am. I am a white person walking, biking, and driving around this city, and I've spent most of my time here living on the South Side. If I go through Peggy McIntosh's checklist from 1989 called Unpacking White Privilege, I can check off every box. I can, if I wish, arranged to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I won't be followed or harassed. I can turn on the television or open the front page of the paper and see people of my race widely represented. The list goes on. The same is not true of my gender or my gender expression though. One thing I realized a few years ago after 10 years of therapy is that much like with my awareness of my race and my privilege when I'm walking around the city, I don't have a gender until I step out my front door. I don't have a gender in my own home. In my own home, I'm just Alex. I live in a cozy, colorful little ranch house in South Shore, I'm surrounded by really warm, friendly neighbors. I know most of my neighbors on my street. And the whole street is lined with bungalows and other ranch houses and two and three flats and trees and parkways. I live across the street from this very heavily used park and playground. It's always full of laughing children and almost year round barbecues and baseball games. So a few months after moving into my home, one of my neighbors introduced himself to me as I was walking my dog Winkles. Uh, he waved to me as he emerged from his front door. I had already seen him a few times, but this was our first time interacting. And he was an elder, black, 
like 97% of the people in my neighborhood, uh, freckled, his shoulders were stooped, and he had short frizzled gray hair, and he had a really joyful smile. And he waved at me and he said, hey there, I saw you just moved in there on the corner. Welcome to the black. My name is Mr. Green. Now I've never learned his first name since this first occasion. And I always referred to him as Mr. Green. I really like this level of formality and respect we have. I responded, good morning. Nice to meet you. My name is Alex. Well, hey, Alex, you live in there all by yourself? You ain't got no man around? Now this question might have given me pause in my younger days. It might have actually made my blood boil depending on who was asking it. But at this point, I tend to just laugh it off. I have snappy rejoinders for anyone who asks me things like that. Still, it often surprises me how often I receive questions like this from complete strangers. Nope, I responded. First of all, I'm gay. And second of all, I'm single. And third of all, I've got brothers. They never do a damn thing around my mama's house. And I got to do all her handiwork. What are they going to do for me? So Mr. Green blinked a couple times, a little dumbstruck, not expecting this response. But then he recovered and he laughed and he slapped his thigh. And he said, all right then, all right, all right, all right. And where'd you move from? Woodlawn. Okay, so you like living in the hood then. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't put it that way necessarily, but I did love Woodlawn and I do love South Shore. And I have to say, I do think other white people are very annoying. So I loved living in Woodlawn and I love living here. I hope you won't hold it against me that I'm one of them. And Mr. Green also was not expecting that. So he laughed even harder this time. And he tilted his head back and he was wiping his eyes. And he said, all right now, Alex, all right, all right. I'm gonna introduce you to my wife when you see her. She gotta meet you. Welcome to the neighborhood. And as I walked off with Winkles, I could hear him continuing to giggle into the background. Now, the reason I'm telling this story is I didn't have a gender until I walked out my front door with Winkles. And I also didn't really have a sexuality until Mr. Green asked me if I had a man around. But everywhere I go, everything I do outside of my home, I'm constantly reminded of it. So I wonder if Mr. Green would have asked me if I had a man, if I looked less like a man in the way that I dress and walk, cut my hair. I've noticed over the years that I get gendered more than most. It's like it's something I'm never allowed to forget. I mean, to this day, I get that question in various forms. I also get called sir and then quickly ma'am, and I get called brother and sister and little lady and dude in so many of my daily interactions. Everyone from my Metro conductor to the barista announcing my coffee is ready, they hypercorrect when they feel they've misgendered me the first time. But almost no one ever actually asks me what my gender is. And it doesn't seem to register that we don't need to be gendered in the first place to fill a tank of gas or to pay for a train ride. What does my gender have to do with how I want my iced coffee? So while I walk through the world with a lot of privilege that I recognize and try to hold myself accountable to, I realize at the same time how dehumanizing it is and how uncomfortable it is to walk through the world with people constantly putting you in an unnecessary box that you don't fit into in the first place. I felt so like an other growing up that I thought there was no way I could be a human like other humans. I thought there was no way I could be a boy or a girl like other boys and girls. I never felt like I belonged anywhere. It's amazing how being othered on a daily basis did that to me. Now, when I'm walking Winkles around my neighborhood, children don't gender me, at least not at first. I have the most interesting interactions with children of anyone. They don't just stare, grown-ups stare a lot, but kids don't just stare because they're curious and they're open in a way that grown-ups aren't. 
So instead, children walk right up and ask to me, are you a boy or a girl? Now, when they first did this, I used to answer, I'm a girl. Then I realized that wasn't true. So I started to answer, I'm both. That actually felt true, but it didn't start a conversation. It just confused them. So now when children ask me that question, I answer the answer that I think feels the most true to me. I ask, why does it matter? That actually starts a conversation. When I answer this way to children, I'm not trying to be provocative or proselytize or upset anyone. What I hope arises from these interactions is a new generation that can absorb that answer, that can really think about that question and remember it when they come across the next person that they can't categorize or another person who seems very different from them. And instead of seeing that person as an other, they can see them as a human or even better, as a friend. Oh, thank you so much, Alex. This is your first time telling story. How do you feel? Uh, very nervous. I'm pretty sweaty. I'm glad you can't see it. <laughs> Uh, and I'm watching you. Uh, I'm so proud of you. Uh, and, and thank you so much. And I, I love this piece in terms of that you explore both the privilege and the oppression and the dynamics of it. Uh, you know, how we are rooted in the white heteropatriarchy society, how gender is so rooted in our daily interactions and also this dynamics that we are right that in terms of members of the LGBTQIA community are, are both invisibilized structurally, but also hyper visibilized interpersonally. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. And, and we're going to come back to have a discussion after that. As I love this dynamics between privileges, whiteness, uh, and then sexuality and gender. A lot to talk about. Thank you, Alex. Oh, I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, thank you for tuning. We're listening to stories gather uh, as a community, build intimacy and vulnerability, um, and, and as that build our intimate community. Um, the way to understand one another really is through uh, listening to each other's stories, put ourselves in other people's shoes, um, connection, right? That's really at the root of the understanding, uh, empathy, compassion, and hopefully action. And so each storyteller is going to highlight through personal narratives, the different issues that we confront as a society. It doesn't necessarily mean these are the only issues, uh, but these are the issues uh, that within current context that we need to confront. Our third storyteller, Sina Sam, uh, she was born in a Thai refugee camp, raised in Seattle as a daughter of Cambodian genocide survivors. She identifies proudly as a 1.5 generation Khmer American. Most recently, she managed community support campaigns at the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. And prior to that, she was an IT specialist at Washington State University. And, and so mentoring um, students, uh, API students, undocumented students, refugee students. She was also uh, the commissioner for the governor's commission on Asian Pacific American affairs of Washington state. Sina is highly accomplished uh, and I'm so thankful uh, she has been on my shows a few times, highly talented, uh, really creative. So I'm so excited to have Sina here. Sina, take it over. Thank you so much, Ada, for that super amazing introduction. And thank you so much for having me, Cook County. Um, Racial Equity um, and Diversity Week is so important at any institution in any city. So I am so honored to take part and share um, a piece that um, I wrote. Uh, it's a very personal piece and I shared with Dr. Chang before. I didn't consider myself an artist or creative. Um, 
a year ago, but since uh, creating this piece and exploring um, the connections and inter intersectionality of my work and allies and communities um, that need advocacy, I have definitely stepped more into this role. So I'll just go ahead and start with my piece. It's called um, Refugee Kid. Um, oh, my Refugee kid. Kid, I kid you not. I was conceived and born in what would be considered the middle of nowhere. A valley between mountains, a clearing between trees, a tight spot between tigers and bears, snakes and landmines, bombings, war and genocide. A stateless, nationless, nowhere you would ever want your child to go home. But I was born there. Can you imagine? A refugee camp, a makeshift muddy encampment lined with tent sticks, tarps, and plastic housing hundreds of thousands of malnourished, bleeding, tortured, hungry, starving, dying, broken bodies, hearts, and souls. I was born there. If you looked on a map now, you might find my birthplace, a small dot in some random clearing somewhere between the border of Cambodia and Thailand. Land, I kid you not, my homeland is neither here or there. Seattle, Chicago, Cambodia, probably not refugee camp or anywhere. You see, I was born a refugee kid, and refugee kids like me, we cross oceans, skies and mountains. We are the land, the bridge, the hopes, the dreams, and everything in between. Do you know what it means to be everything and to start from nothing at the same time? When you look at a refugee, what do you see? Do you see me? Threatening, heartbreaking, those pitiful things, those poor refugees in the far away land, frozen in time, our identity, a consequence of some awful time. The poor unaccompanied minors, those asylum seekers, illegals, criminals, allies abandoned in Afghanistan, Haiti, El Salvador, Eritrea, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, children caged at the border border. I kid you not, my homeland has no borders. You see, if you're born a kid like me, there is no country to derive our citizenship. There is no easy way, no family tree to fill in that school assignment. There's no ancestry.com to look up your lineage or family name. There's no easy way to ask who are my people and how did we get here? There's no easy way to be everything and nothing. Nothing. Do you know what it feels like to come from nothing? To not even feel pain because the trauma has numbed you to your bare bones? Do you know what it feels like to lose everything you've ever cared for and everyone you've ever loved? That even being ripped apart away from people and things you hate is painful. life again in anything. I never lived through it, the killing fields. But the thing about intergenerational trauma is every survivor, every generation after you lived through it too. In our own ways, we breathe in your suffering and exhale out your pain. The trauma, the anguish, everything you try to shield from us, everything you want to leave in a past lifetime follow of it finds us living diaspora, carrying collective, unspeakable phantom pain and loss. Loss. Do you ever wonder why it feels like our languages are being lost? That with every younger generation of any hyphen American, Khmer American, Chinese American, Korean American, Indian American, wait, which Indian is that? Indian from India or indigenous First Nation, Duwamish, Navajo, Cherokee, or based Indian. 
okay, well, how about being African American? Wait, which Black American is that? Af African American immigrant or those camped and violently forced across oceans, land to seas, brutally separated from family roots, identity, placed into labor camps to build this fine country. Could they be considered reverse refugees? Are they my people too? Your people? Our people? Whose people? Whose land? No one is illegal and stolen land, right? Or is it only legal when we're stealing people. People. People forced into slavery, genocide, trail of tears, 13th Amendment, modern enslavement, societal pressure is turned into internalized hatred, into partner patriarchal or state violence, fleeing war, persecution, internment, or refugee camps. All a crime. So why is it that we all can't just be Americans again without the hyphen. Oh, well, maybe, maybe I'll save that discussion for another time. There is a reason why we're always lost for words. When elders ask, and we respond back in our broken Khmer and English, I know how to speak Khmer. Even if we know more, we respond back in short, exasperated, embarrassed responses. Or nothing at all. Silence. Because we know our broken tongues sting your heart. And not hold anymore. We know children of diaspora. We know. We know that you've been through hell and back. But when you've come from a world that creates refugee kids like us, it can be easier to be ruled and to care, to fail and to try, to push away than to hold close, to yell and to comfort, to hoard than to collect, to be in denial and to feel the loss. We know and your dreams and ours, when we catch your tired eyes, all the hardship you endure, what made it possible for you to survive, why it's been so hard to thrive, we know. I know. But yeah, it's still so hard to take it. Right, refugee kids, we learn a lot from survivors of violence. We soak up the trauma, the tragedy. We see the weight of colonialism, the devastation of systems of oppression that makes it so hard to get to the healing, right? We know. It's always the harm, never the people that should be discarded. Imagine being born a refugee kid, forced into a world to be everything from nothing, blamed, disowned, discarded, deported, they're forced to be a refugee endlessly. Endlessly. We know everyone is deserving of healing. So we try. We try to dance, to sing, to dress, to eat, eat, to cook, to speak in our broken tongues, to laugh, to play, to honor ancestors lost along the way, to raise our kids in healing ways. And maybe in our small big ways of being everything from nothing, we can somehow bring back to life what was so brutally taken, silence beaten out of this world that we have inherited, all the sacrifice, regret, pain, anger, horror, stolen dreams, suffering, and lives lost that all came at a cost. Future generations should know its name, its face, its inhumane cycles are recycled. Lost. Systems of oppression that should pay for all this loss, not our goal. On coming, our precious children, refugee American, maybe that's us, giving grace, gratitude, and connecting the dots, reminders but should not ever be repeated. No shame, never get. Look at what we built. We are the refugees. refuge, the home, the land, the bridge. We are hope. We are dreams. We shouldn't have to be, but we know this world needs us to be everything.
I be looking on my plate, touching I qualify. Next bag, I'm going to be Thank you. so much uh sina so this is what we're gonna do we are having some uh connection issue we couldn't quite hear you it was a little bit choppy uh so this is what i'm gonna ask you to do uh if you can lock out and then lock back in um what i'm going to see is i might bring you back again uh to tell the story um just if, if we have enough time and if not, uh, I want to make sure that you have tons of things to say during our discussion. But I think it would be important for you to lock out first um, and, and then come back in. But this is such an important story uh, that we cannot understand the present without looking at the past. Uh, think about uh, what's happening in Afghanistan. Think about the refugee crises, not just one crisis, it's just crises looking at the, the the united states military and political interventions not just happening right now when we look at the experience of of southeast asian refugees we see what's happening <coughs> in this country so uh i apologize for uh, the sound quality but this is a really important story to tell and i'm going to uh bring back uh sina to tell that story uh, and I'm going to creatively use this time, so do not worry. Thank you so much, everybody. Our next storyteller, God, I'm so excited to have Garcia. We uh, are, it's like we met uh, so many years ago, and then Garcia went to New York for school. Uh, and I'm so excited to have Garcia here. Garcia is a queer uh, pen clicker head scratcher, sandwich eater, uh, born and raised in the death of Chicago South Sides and recently graduated from New York Tisch School of Arts. Congratulations, Garcia. They made their on-screen acting debut in Netflix original series, Tales of the City. So if you saw them, if you see them, you might know that this is somebody who is on screen on movies before as Jake Rodriguez and recently guest starred on Freedom's Party of Five as a uh, Freeform's Party of Five as Matthew. So Garcia, I'm so excited about your piece. Take it over. Uh, thank you so much, Ada. Um, okay, uh, the importance of community. Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, all over, we moved a lot, and I uh, grew up in pretty rough neighborhoods. And you know, um, I I couldn't really tell you where the beginning of my community starts. Um, it could be in those neighborhoods. It could be in in the blood that runs that will forever run through me. And um, but one that I immediately almost always go to is, is the theater. And, and specifically it would be Free Street Theater on the north side of Chicago. Um, and even more specifically, the first ensemble I ever worked with, I was about 16, 17 at the time. Uh, Free Street is a non-for-profit theater that aims to create original and thought-provoking theater by, for, about, with, and in Chicago's diverse communities. Um, Free Street is where uh, I found a space to grow and a, a safe space to grow and to grow safely. Uh, I found seeds to learnings that I would unteach and reteach the the harmful rhetoric I had the harmful rhetoric I had been carrying in my mouth for seventeen years. The machismo ass behavior I ebbed and flowed through for years. Machismo ass behavior that I learned from the kids at school and in the handfuls of neighborhoods I moved in and out of all over the city. Um, I didn't know the environments I was circulating in were showing me a harmful way of thinking and being. Uh, I totally thought it was okay to call someone a pussy if they were being a pussy. But in this new environment filled with people who were interested in a better world, a world filled with questions and ways of thinking that were entirely new to 17-year-old me, 
um, people that I couldn't playfully, what I thought was playful at the time, name call uh, because of, of, of the kids in neighborhoods that I grew up in. And I thought that that was okay. And to an extent we learned that like rough love is love. And, but then I was finally thrown into a space that if I did any of the, uh, if I spoke any harmful rhetoric, if I had any like machismo weird behavior, I, I was called out for it and I was questioned for it. And why was it not okay to be sensitive? Why, why could we not allow ourselves to feel what we feel and go as far as to share those feelings too? And I was, I was stunned. I, I, I was like, y'all actually want to talk about your feelings. You really want to listen to me talk about mine and, and I won't be judged for it. That's crazy. And, but, but it was true. And, this non-for-profit theater space is, is where I began to collect the tools for my toolbox, my, my toolbox that I was building for, to help me build healthier relationships in my life. And I found people who were seeking to work on themselves in both eerily similar and vastly different ways than I was. And I had found chosen family and I had found a home for the queerest of queers to thrive and breathe in and breathe in life into the most authentic parts of themselves and also the most authentic parts of myself. I had found a community of people who unlocked a shit ton of questions within me and also provided me a handful of guidance to lead me to answers I didn't know I needed to in my, my whole life prior. This revelation only led me to seek more of this. Uh, where could I find more spaces, more people, more love and communication like this? Where could I continue to learn to understand and also continue to be understood or or at least be surrounded by people who wanted to learn just as much as I did? I was pushed to apply to one of the most prestigious drama programs in the country. I had no idea what it was or what it entailed or who would be there. And a handful of people partook in took part in helping me to apply, mentors, friends, old high school educators. Anyway, so fast forward and I was accepted. And at the time of my acceptance, I was working three jobs and had been independent, independently supporting myself for a few years already. Um, anyway, so along with the acceptance came a $1,500 fee, $500 to take my yes seriously and a thousand for a deposit down on housing. Uh, and it was unexpected, this fee. I, I didn't have the 500. I didn't have the 1,000 nonetheless to put down in such short notice. But what I did have was was a community of people. And I did what most people have been doing nowadays when, they're, when they are in need of funds. I started to go fund me. And this was back in like summer of 2017. And anyway, so I turned to my community. I turned to the network, the Facebook network of people I had befriended over the years, I, I turned, to, um, I asked them to donate, to share, to share if they couldn't donate. And in less than 24 hours, I had raised the funds. And um, anyway, that's a whole nother story of like what that even means within itself. But anyway, through a series of events, uh, I was led to New York and I fall into the classrooms of New York's Tisch School of the Arts and I met a shit ton of white people and imposter syndrome, or at least I think it was imposter syndrome. I'm also told it could very well have been the structural inequalities embedded within academia. Um, the first few months were weird and difficult and confusing. Um, the first semester I felt like I had no idea what theater was or I didn't have a proper understanding of it because I hadn't read a bunch of old dead white men's works. and. I was surrounded by a bunch of white kids that had came from high schools that put on entire productions of Hairspray and Shakespeare and they knew about Chekhov and the Seagull. I don't, I didn't know any of that stuff. I, the only work I had ever been a part of, I had co-written and co-produced and I began to delegitimize all the work I had done prior. And anyway, luckily I, something snapped in me and I got it together and I started to see that half these people couldn't even act and everyone back home would wipe the floor with them and a monologue face off. And I started to realize that some of the smartest and most brilliant people are kept out from institutions that only care about who can pay them the most. And more and more things started to come to light and I was entirely, and that was entirely something else to deal with. Um, it wasn't until the end of my first semester that I started to solidify my tribe. I started to make friends, three really good friends that have now turned into family and that family has slowly expanded and they are what have kept me going these last four years here in New York. 
I found people who had bits of home and bits of free street, but amplified by like a thousand because these were the people that I had been looking for. These were the people that allow me to exist entirely as is myself and all that I come with, all that I am, all that like people back home would probably never accept me for, but oddly they do because these are the same people and communities that helped me even get to the place where I am today. Anyway, ever since finding theater, I've been on the hunt for people who share the same values and beliefs and are interested in love filled with an abundance of care. And I was lucky to find a tribe that held me throughout college and a tribe that continues to hold me today. Um, as you can tell, my body still chokes up and I become overwhelmed by this unbelievable thought that, well, this unbelievable truth, I'm sorry, that there is support, that I have support in this world, in this lifetime. And I'm only here today able to tell you this story because there are people who have never given up on me and continue to believe in my growth. And I struggled with whether or not I should introduce my inter intersectionalities in the beginning of this or at the end of it. And I, you know, but it doesn't, I, it's hard to define like what makes you, you. And you know, if you ask me, I'm just a person as Alex said, like my gender doesn't matter. I'll in within the confines of like my comfort zone, which is like, it includes the people that love me. And anyway, I'm just one small example of what is possible when a community comes together to love and care and support a person that is Latinx, non-binary, um, um, marginalizations of, com of, 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 com of complexities, but to anyone and everyone that has ever helped me along the way and get to where I am today. And I'm forever indebted to a community of people that have helped me and continue to help me follow my dreams. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Gosh, yes, Garcia, I was almost crying when you were talking. Uh, you know, now also people know, you know, in terms of imagine intersect, uh, you know, it's the importance of community. The fragility talks about inequity within the medical institution. Institutions, Alex talked about the rooted in terms of our construction and gender, whiteness and oppression in our daily interactions. Sina takes us to the global stage looking at refugee uh, uh, issues and, and they are existing, all of us. Then how do we make progress? How do we proceed, right? Community, community is a basis of action. And I think it's several things that you mentioned that are so important. Oftentimes we pay attention to theaters on the north side right, or are seen on the north side, the performance are, that, that's where the reviews come from. But we don't pay attention to the theaters doing the done in different communities. Yes, they are so vital in building the community that's so important. Another thing is not really imposter syndrome because when you navigate the academic space, you have to ask a question, who is, how is the system designed, set up, for whom? from whose perspective. And if you over and over only have to read white people, white men's work, then you are gonna miss out. You know, penance uh, is not universal, it's particular, it's partial. And, and so it's really important for us to really think about what you bring up, it's not just a community. How do we even decolonize our mind, right? What we consider as the standard, the norm, and the canon. And these are important issues that we're going to come back to talk about. I'm so excited uh, about this piece. Thank you so much, Garcia. So important. Thank you. Our final storyteller, it's me. Uh, I'm Ada Jen. Uh, I'm a professor turned storyteller, uh, storytelling show producer, and solo performer. And uh, the action, right? The, the most the important part, the understanding is not enough, is the action. Uh, the past two years, I mean, we talk a lot about anti-Asian racism, but anti-Asian racism is nothing new. So this piece is a series of interactions between myself, 
uh, and a student at UIC. Uh, I was working at UIC at the time, and I received this message from a student. So I'm going to tell the story. Dear university staff, hello. I want to report an insulting incident that happened to us today. My friends and I were at this building trying to grab some coffee. We were waiting in line and finally, when it was our turn to order, we stepped forward. During that short time, we heard an absurd racist joke that people at the cashier made saying, watch out for the coronavirus. As everyone knows, the coronavirus is a global issue that has taken away more than 500 innocent lives, treating us as that virus is both humiliating and insulting to the people who are suffering and fighting for that contagious disease. It is very unfortunate that this occurred during the Black History Month in 2020. The month that we all believe everyone should not be discriminated based on the color of their skin. I hope you examine this issue. We sincerely want an apology for this inconvenience. Sincerely, student. Dear student, thank you so much for the message. I'm very sorry this happened to you. I would like to meet in person to discuss the situation further. Let me know when you can stop by. Ada. Dear Ada, thank you for your kindness. We were all furious about the incident. However, after knowing that there are people who actually care for minorities like us, it gives us pride knowing that we chose to come to this school. Again, thank you for offering us the option to deal with this matter. But we have decided not to make a scene, student. Dear student, I don't think you will ever read this message. I do hope at some point you will tell the story on your own. I haven't been able to sleep for days since I received your email. That last sentence, we have decided not to make a scene, hit me hard. That sentence has filled me with sadness. It feels like someone has driven a knife slowly into my heart. I'm not going to die from it, but my heart aches and bleeds with each gentle cut and push. Your message was the first complaint I received, but it was not the first one I have heard. Since the outbreak of the coronavirus, we have seen an increase of hatred toward Chinese people, people of Asian descent or Asian Americans in general. Physical assaults have taken place, racial slurs hurled, Suspicious looks cast, masks put on specifically when Asian people are present. Otherwise, socially conscious people making jokes and references about the virus and Chinese people. Businesses in Chinatown plummeted due to misinformation, xenophobia, and racism. In a world where racism is often seen between black and white, Discrimination, prejudice, racism, and xenophobia toward and against Asian are often taken for granted and normalized. That like even you see at Berkeley briefly posted something online along the line. Xenophobia is a normal response after the outbreak. Our own president insisting on calling the virus Chinese or Wuhan virus, knowing fully well that the pandemic will bring out pre existing hatred xenophobic sentiments, and racist assault against people of Asian descent. Different universities send warning emails to students about the virus, yet few make public statements denouncing anti-Asian racism. We don't label any germ disease, illness, or virus white when they wiped out Native American tribes. Why do we label Corona Asian? 
This pandemic shows how easily we, as Asian Americans, can go from being model minority to yellow peril in this country within seconds. But what I wanted to write here is not about the virus. It is about that last sentence of yours. We have decided not to make a scene. I truly see you because you remind me of my younger self. When I used to believe that people would understand where I was coming from and empathize with my position if I were polite enough, respectful enough, articulate enough, or liked enough. And then it dawned on me one day, my degree of politeness, respectfulness, or likability has little to do with whether people can grasp the complexity of issues. For many, they understand them all along. In my, our culture, I was taught since I was young to be quiet, to not speak up, to not challenge authorities, and to keep peace and maintain harmony. I had to work very hard to develop my own voice and to have one. When I was younger, I tried hard to balance between having a voice and wanting to be liked, having ideas and opinions and being seen too opinionated and loud and telling people how I really felt and what I really thought and not wanting to alienate anyone with my truth. I still struggle with that and I'm in my 50s. The reality is there's no balance. It is a lose-lose situation for me as a woman. I do have the benefit of racial perception. I'm hardly seen as militant or aggressive as an Asian woman, even when I am, compared to a Black woman who can easily be seen as aggressive, even when she's simply being assertive. My body, as much as it may be sexually objectified, exoticized, or violated, it's not seen as threatening, less allowing me to freely navigate the world without anyone calling the police on me. And we know the ways our bodies are perceived can have life and death consequences. But the worst part is this. When you don't practice speaking up for yourself, you end up losing the only voice you have, your own. I want you to remember this. Silence can be a strength, but it isn't always a virtue. Being quiet doesn't always bring you peace. Being polite doesn't always keep you out of trouble. Being respectful doesn't always get you the respect in return. Please, learn to tell your own story as I can always tell stories for others. Learn to shout on top of your lung. Make a scene. Be the troublemaker. Be the trouble for yourself and others. It's time. It's time. Ada. Ooh, that's my piece. Uh, Alex, um, it's five after four. I think what we can do is to bring everybody to the screen uh, for us to have a conversation. And I'm going to very good. I want to welcome back uh, everybody. Um, very good. Thank you. And, uh, so I think I'm going to start with Sina. Um, and thank you so much for logging in, logging back, right. Uh, in terms of the action, my piece really is a, it's about, it's about all the story reflects, right. Imagine intersection action. Uh, but I want to start with Sina. Uh, you know, there's a reason why I invite each one of them, particularly thinking about the crisis in Afghanistan and before that, the Middle East, the Iraq, right? Never ending the Syria, right? We know what's happening at present is uh, it's important because the past already gives us examples 
of the failure of U.S. policy. I want you to say a few words, the importance of your piece and, and what you want to emphasize through your piece. Go ahead, Sina. Sure. Um, hopefully I'm coming in okay right now. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes. So much. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Um, thank you for having me back. And I, I'm very sorry um, that my piece was choppy for those who was listening in. Um, important not only to um, uh, refugees, immigrants, um, communities who um, are under siege and attack and um, separated, um, needing advocacy, and, um, you know, intersectionally. We've covered so much of it with um, the storytellers here. And in particular, in this current moment, um, sharing my piece about being a refugee um, is just resonating uh, with the uh, um, what Dr. Chang mentioned in terms of failed foreign policy and intervention in um, countries that have um, not only created refugee kids like me, continues to do so in, in current conflict. Um, so we've, we're seeing that in Afghanistan right now. Um, we've seen that in um, countries I've mentioned in my piece. Um, I'm more than happy to share, you know, like a document of it for anyone who maybe is more visual and would like to read it. And so, and I apologize for a trigger warning as well. I know um, topics like this can be very triggering um, when we're talking about death, genocide, um, but it's all very important. And um, to be able to share my piece and then connect with all of the important issues of racial equity in this country um, that also connects, you know, locally, nationally, globally. So thank you for having me. Very good. Thank you so much, Sina. And, and I think one thing I want to share, right, even uh, even though in Sina's uh, short piece talk about the trauma, the, uh, you know, the, not just the trauma of refugees, uh, the, you know, at the camp experiencing um, in terms of escaping the refugee camp, but also intergeneration trauma how it can be passed on uh, to the second generation or third generation. But here's the thing, uh, all of us here in the room, you know, survive something, right, to tell our story. So I don't want to just really focus on trauma, but really looking at the resilience um, uh, in terms of uh, resilience, right? Uh, in terms of when I work with uh, National Cambodian Heritage in Museum here in Chicago, a lot of their programming about culture, dance, music, and language really is about uh, a community of people, not just surviving, but also thriving. Um, very good. So I'm going to have both in terms of, I'm going to have Alex go first in terms of looking at the rootedness, right, of gender. And then also, Alex, do you talk, so talk about privilege, which is something that oftentimes people don't want to talk about, right? That we want to talk about other people's suffering, but we don't examine how we can be complicit, right? Because of our privileges, uh, that how we can be complicit uh, in the system. If it's all focused on marginalized communities, uh, the suffering, then that defeats the whole point. The point is how do those of us who are also in privileged position navigate, understand uh, our privilege and choose to act differently. Talk a little bit about, you know, how do you wrestle with the oppression and privilege? How do you, how do you come to this point? Um, that's, you know, that's a very good question. I think, um, I don't know, I was feeling really challenged when I was trying to pick a story to tell as, as Ada could tell the, the viewers, but because um, I felt like I had so many different stories that illustrated similar things, but um, what really made me understand very early on how my privilege and my oppression kind of really intersected um, was uh, when I was a little kid, I lived in South Carolina, and I, I realized that I was gay and that I was, you know, of some sort of gender variance, like something was not the same about me as the other kids when I was really young. So I, I always felt very different. And I used to um, just be really horrified to see any 
racism on display in my school and also anyone being bullied, especially boys being bullied for being suspected to be gay. And because my parents really raised me to be fearless and to speak up whenever I see something wrong, I feel like my privilege worked a lot in, in my favor in order to do that. Um, as a white person and as someone who uh, was already considered an outsider because of moving into the deep south with very clearly not a southern accent um, and being very different, I spoke up when I saw kids being bullied, whether it was because of race or gender or sexuality or anything. Um, so I, I felt like it, it started me very young standing up for bullies. Um, and I feel like I've, I've always wanted to do that ever since. Looks like Jolie is back, so I'm adding her back to the screen. Very good. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, you know, uh, this is this is a, the virtual world because, you know, the pandemic. Uh, so I thank you, everyone, and, and it's never I can try to tackle everything. Uh, I'm going to have Garcia, right, it, because it's also you, you deal with in terms of on the other side being uh, trans person, non-binary, uh, looking at the gender, sexuality, and race. How do you navigate the world where, uh, you know, in daily life when the world really is not designed uh, for you? How do you, uh, you know, contest and challenge? How, how does that, uh, how do you navigate that? Well, I think um, so similarly to what Alex has mentioned, uh, I have over time um, gained tremendous privilege because of my, strictly because of the way I look. Um, and there's a safety in that, in, in this world. And, and there was, and that's been a safety that I've just slowly came into in the beginnings of my transition. And I didn't realize my brain wasn't catching up with what was going on around me. And, um, but I, I, not that I ever felt like I was in danger in any part of my life, but I, because just again, just your, the neighborhoods I grew up in, I just, that was normal to me anyway, um, in whatever way I appeared. But uh, there was obviously violence that I experienced when I was a tomboy and I would go into the women's restroom and I would be chased after and they would try to kick me out, but then they realized that I was in the correct bathroom, um, so to speak, right? Uh, so it, I think that it is only when I intentionally choose to dress a specific way that then it, I have to start to think, how am I going to navigate the outside world? What is my day going to look like? Is this safe to wear shorts that are uh, like thigh high and a tank top? Like, which I only do when I'm it, with my friends and I'm a group of friends because I am just not in a place yet in my journey like other mask presenting people that can step outside with a full face of makeup and a skirt and whatever uh as we know traditional women's clothing to be like i i'm not there yet uh, to do alone at least um which is sad and it's and i and it's just it, you know but it is like you have to ask yourself do i want to deal with this today uh no probably not so i don't um but in my in my privilege that I've that I've come across, I think that I always try to make femme presenting people feel as safe as possible, and like to not. Uh, it's just something as small as like even walking down the street in the middle of the night, not to walk too close to a woman in front of me, and just to, if I am, I'm gonna like try to because you can immediately just the, your pres. I've learned that my presence just can make someone uncomfortable, uh, which is sad, and but it's so true. Um, or just again, like what Alex was saying, it's just like I use my voice and like I'm always calling something out because I can in the you know when I can, and yeah, I guess I'm just always questioning: Is this a time to use my privileges? It is. Then I will, um, because you know we realize there are a lot of people around us that absolutely do not, um, and I think that I like to have one up on other people that are also mass presenting, uh, because yeah, so I just. It's it's a constant uh, navigating and renavigating and and making sure that I'm just doing the best that I always can. I think. You know something you mentioned is so important. Uh, Microaggression. 
right? Uh, essentially, microaggression is a form of violence. Uh, we use microaggression, but essentially, uh, it is about racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, right? Microaggression can manifest itself in so many different ways. And so for those of us who are receiving and you, you say something so important, the question is, it would be exhausting if we have to contest, if we have a challenge, right? Every time, right? And, and it becomes this where we have to pick and choose when it is appropriate, right? When it is okay. And even I think something that you say is safe for us to challenge when one of the reason that it is so uh, important for us to think about gender, transgender, non-binary issue is looking at a series of legislation that has been proposed and passed to uh, against, right? LGBTQIA community. And that's something important for us to really think about as soon as we safely navigate the world, how do we understand that others may not have the privilege. Then the question is, how do we challenge the system? Now, I want to come back to Julie, uh, because that's just a great point. And we're talking about in life and death situation, right? What's your thoughts in terms of the medical institution, in terms of the bias that they have uh, for racial minorities? Uh, and this is historical, right? This is not just now contemporary historical. We look at a medical experimentation against racial minority, minorities in this country, right? So connected to slavery. So I want to give uh, Julie uh, a few minutes to, to say uh, what you, what's important about story and, and what you want to highlight with your story. Thank you, Ada. So one of the things that has always been important to me as a young black woman, specifically in such a, a critical situation while birthing my twins, is that, you know, I'm a person that knows better. You know, I have educated myself on the maternal health crisis and everything like that. But I feel like it's my obligation and my responsibility as a black mother going forward to make sure the young black mothers don't experience, experience biases and the assumption that because I'm black, I don't feel as much pain or that I'm not as educated or what have you. And so I think it's very important for me going forward to just make people understand that, you know, Black women are people too, especially in a country where um, our voices haven't always been heard. And I experienced that firsthand. And I really feel like it's also a social economic crisis too, as well as like racial disparities. And so my kids, I only had like public aid insurance because I'm self-employed. And I think that had a lot to do with the way I was treated and how I was perceived. You know what I mean? So I think that going forward, it's important for people like me to share my stories that, so that, you know, this is getting to the right people that need to hear it. I don't need to tell my story to other black women. They probably experienced some of the things that I've experienced. But, you know, to the medical professionals listening to me, it's like, oh, maybe something will click because I've been so transparent in my story absolutely i i really like you know your point uh you know stories are important and you know but stories are not the end point but at least the narratives and stories have to be out there otherwise you know it's always assumption we are making assumption about the world about someone's experiences right and so it's really important in terms of uh, you know, when we critique the institution, uh, we're talking about a structural system inequity, but those in, in various forms of inequities also they trickle down to our interpersonal dynamics and relationships, and and that has effect on us tremendously. So that's really important for us to think about how to address that. So, you know, my story, uh, and I'm going to ask all of you, my story really is about, uh, you know, bringing the good trouble, being the troublemaker, 
contest. And I know all of you have done uh, from where you are, telling stories, uh, resisting, right? Challenge authorities uh, that, you know, asking the question, who needs to hear this? And so my story really is about, uh, you know, if you don't challenge, if you don't speak out, if you don't speak up, really the voice that is going to be lost is yours. Uh, so I want you to, uh, you know, what do you think is the action? Uh, uh, usually like what are the things that people can do from where they, they are uh, in terms of what's the action that needs to be taken? What things, uh, you don't, it doesn't have to be grand, you know, what are the things if our audience members that are listening, what are the things that they can do? What's the action here? Uh, Alex, go ahead. Oh, let's see, action. I mean, I think the big um, thing that I, I like to share, especially as I hear other people's stories more and more, is uh, white people. <laughs> One of the biggest questions that I get about Racial Equity Week that drives me crazy is um, people are like, well, what about white people? Why do we need a week like this? Uh, say, because everyone needs to be acting to make everything better. Uh, you know, men be feminists, white people need to be anti-racists. Everyone needs to understand everyone else's perspective and you need to extra mile to make sure that you are actually acting on your commitments and pledges about diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, you know, it's, it's a very performative thing that we're hearing. Uh, my colleague Denise calls it equity theater and, and it drives me crazy. And if it's not about your words, except when we're telling stories, it's about your actions. Um, so if you're not backing your words up with actions, it's meaningless. Like with Jolie's stories, I feel like what I'm thinking of is that so many of the doctors that we interact with are white men. Why is that? Why are so many of our teachers white? We need diversity in the institutions that are interacting with people in their most vulnerable states and in their most um, developmental states. You know, kids need to experience diversity People who are on a hospital bed need to be able to relate to a doctor who understands them. I've had horrific experiences just with going to a gynecologist who treated me strangely because of my gender variance. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't even a man, it was a woman who just clearly had not had any sensitivity training. And I, I just see so many places where we could be acting and could be just putting at least 10% more effort in being inclusive and understanding other people's perspectives. Absolutely. And one thing I want to, you know, there's a difference. I mean, we, since uh, if we, we think about, you know, the pandemic and, and look at the police brutality, right, uh, in terms of the murder of Black people. So these past few years, we see a lot of, for example, our scene institutions, theater, right? Now, Black Lives Matter, right, uh, the, the act, Right. Let's add black people, uh, Latinx people, Asian people, Asian Americans to their lineup. But the question really is, you, you know, you raise the question about performative activism. Right now, people want to do diversity and inclusion. But here's the, the, the point that you're raising is no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with diversity and inclusion because it is if you have the same people from the same community that's tokenizing so you have to think about when we talk about equity most people a lot of the uh producing whether we're shows and events simply adding the color but adding the color doesn't mean center those perspectives it doesn't necessarily mean epistemologically that you are centering a particular perspective Equity is something very different, right? So people want to catch on the trend, the fashion, that's due diversity and inclusion, but never ask questions about if you're talking about equity, what does that mean? If it's all about just pulling people to tell your stories on your show so you can be recognized doing diversity, that's not enough. So we really need to critically examine what's equity. Gacia, would you like to say a few words? what's equity or anything <laughs> you want to say um i think for me in terms of just community as a whole i i 
I think it's just ever since I was little, and I think similarly, again, I'll just keep referencing Alex, but it, and no one had to teach me this. I think I just like, it, when something just didn't sit right, whether it was in the classroom or uh, on the playground, however, definitely not at home, because talking back, that's just not it. But um, it, it, I just called things out if they just didn't, and it just like, why is no one saying anything? And But so then if you're not, I will. And I think that that is the first step to then joining the person alongside you is to be, is to like, defend the other uh, underdog and just, and then that builds, then you have, then you have that friend and then you have another friend and then you just, and then, it, you know, it's, it's like that saying that I always quote so poorly is that, you, you know, never underestimate a small group of individually dedicated or uh, a small group of dedicated people to change the world. They're the only people who ever have. And was it Margaret Atwood that, I don't know who said that, but. Um, it was I, Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead, it was Margaret That's right, Margaret. Mead. Thank you, yes. And and I always think about that, and I, and I always think about how I definitely just would not be where I am if it just wasn't for the people in my life di directly and indirectly, and I can never forget that. And so I spend most of my time just trying to figure out how do I do the exact same for other people, whether I know them or not. Um, whether that's in passing on the street or on the subway or online with uh, fundraisers and go fund, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter um, because, you know, we all need some sort of help. Um, and I don't, and, and because that one day it can be, you, either it, ha it is you or it was you or it can one day be you. And I think that in America, we're so individualistic in thinking that that will never be us because we see violence and things in the news so far from us. But I just am always constantly like, no, that that us could that that could be very much easily be me or someone I know and love and care about. And so it doesn't matter I if I know you or not. I, I want to help you and I want you to know that like you are worthy of, of being helped and cared for and, and like loved and given to no matter your circumstances, no matter where you come from, who you are, what you look like, whatever kind of aid or not aid you're on. It just, to me, that makes absolutely no difference. And as I feel, as long as I just continue to spread that, I am just hoping that that kind of just is passed on uh, from the next person to the next person. And yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, something you mentioned uh, that is so important, it, it, you know, the, for those of us who made it to the institution, right? For those of us who come from marginalized communities, when we made it to the institution, what's our historical responsibility, right? To challenge the institution, right? As you mentioned, in terms of what's now uh, if I'm at this place, what's my responsibility to create spaces, right, for others? And if an institution uh, is the problem, not a solution, then what do we need to do to challenge it, to change it, right, and to to trans transform it, right? And, and so that's really the issues that we need to uh, to construct, not just challenge people, but also challenge the institution. And those of us who have made it, uh, whatever that means, uh, you know, where does our responsibility lie? Wow, it's 1.29. We're at the end of our event. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I'm just going to go around the room just telling me uh, how you're feeling right now. Alex, just one word. Alex? I think they're frozen. Oh, okay. So Alex is frozen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is the issue with with the internet. Uh, Garcia, how do you feel? I'm I'm just grateful. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. How do you feel? I feel honored. Thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely, Sina. How do you feel? I feel um, very alive and connected, even though we're having disconnection issues. <laughs> But emotions are all that matter. We have disconnection issue uh, physically, the internet, but we're all connected. Uh, thank you, everybody, audience, tellers, 
Uh, I hope uh, Alice come back, but if not, it's one thirty. I want to respect people's time, courage to connect, uh, talk to each other, love each other. Thank you. Challenge one another. It's not about diversity, inclusion, not even equality, but equity. Ask yourself, what do you need to do to enhance equity in all aspects of society? Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. All right. I think I'm going to.